Hi everyone, this video goes with chapter three of our textbook, uh, the chapter on uh, prenatal development and birth. Um, and there's just a few things that I wanted to point out in this chapter. <clears throat> One is um, when you're thinking about the three prenatal periods, think about the germinal, embryonic, and fetal periods and not, there's a chart in your book that goes through trimesters. And when we're talking about development, it's much more interesting to talk about the, the periods and what's happening within those periods rather than just a three month period based on the passage of time. So ignore that chart and focus on uh, germinal, embryonic, and fetal. Um, during the germinal stage, it's largely a time of cell division. During the embryonic stage, it's a period of organogenesis. So um, organs are developing, physical formations are being, are being made, <clears throat> and that's gonna be important when you, in the next thing that I talk about, which is teratogens. Um, and then during the fetal period, so the germinal period, first two weeks or so, um, the uh, period of organogenesis, the, um, the embryonic period, from weeks two through eight, and then from the end of week eight through the rest of the pregnancy is the fetal period. And so we refer to the developing organism as an embryo during the embryonic period <clears throat> and as a fetus during the fetal period. And then once, um, once it's born, then we refer to it as an infant, um, just in terms of uh, getting the terminology straight. So um, the next section of your book talks about teratogens. And teratogen, a teratogen is any agent that could cause harm to the developing organism. Um, so um, it could be drugs, it could be something in the environment, it could be stress, it could be alcohol, um, it could be exposure to a pesticide, um, it could be exposure to the flu or the measles. Um, so anything that could harm the developing organism um, is referred to as a teratogen. And as you're reading through that section, I don't expect you to know the exact effects of every single teratogen that they mention, just that there are a number of things that matter when you're thinking about the effect of teratogens on the developing organism. One is timing, right? So if it happens during the germinal period, usually what happens is cell division stops if it's bad enough, right? If, if it meets the threshold uh, for harm, then um, if it's bad enough, then cell division stops and the pregnancy is generally terminated um, in a natural way, a miscarriage. Um, oftentimes the woman doesn't even know she's pregnant. Um, and so there are a lot of pregnancies. So there's actually some, uh, some data, some research data on the, the average number or sort of the estimated number of pregnancies that people never know about. Um, and I remember when I read it for the first time, I was like, how do they measure how many times somebody was pregnant and didn't know because they didn't know, so they couldn't report it. Uh, but there actually is a mechanism for, uh, they were collecting data for another purpose <clears throat> and there were uh, markers either in the urine or in the blood, I haven't read the article for a little while, um, that said that the woman had been pregnant, but she didn't know that she was pregnant. So if it happens during the germinal period, um, usually um, it, you know, it sort of, it, it either self-resolves or the pregnancy is terminated. If it happens during the embryonic period, that's a period of organogenesis. And so timing matters there because that's when you get physical malformations. In other words, if the heart is forming um, and there's a teratogen that, uh, ex that you're exposed to or the organism is exposed to during the period when the heart is forming, then the heart may be malformed. Um, once the heart is formed, it can't be malformed, right? Because it's already there. So what happens is uh, it's a growth issue. So in the embryonic period, it's largely a period of organogenesis and that's when you see uh, physical malformations associated with exposure to a teratogen or that's generally. Um, so timing matters, um, dosage matters, right? It matters how much exposure um, the organism has been, uh, has, has had to withstand. Um, there's usually a threshold effect. So um, sometimes a little bit of something doesn't have an effect and so it needs to meet a particular threshold. Um, there are genetic susceptibilities as well. So there are certain things that, um, that you may be genetically, the mother or the developing organism may be genetically susceptible to um, that another person isn't. Um, so there are a number of factors that can be associated with the ultimate impact that, uh, that a teratogen might have um, on development. Um, so keep that in mind. If it happens during the fetal period, just to sort of close the loop on that, um, that's when there's a period of growth and also um, brain development in particular and brain growth in particular. So um, that's when you see those kinds of things happening. So um, those aren't hard and fast rules, but just generally, if you think about it in that way, I think it will um, help you to, um, to digest and to understand the material um, in that section of the book. Um, in the next part, it talks about um, some aspects of birth, and I want to draw your attention to a couple of things. One, the APGAR test um, is a really fast test um, so that uh, you can determine uh, whether there is uh, distress on the part of the newborn infant, and if so, to have some immediate life-saving measures taken 
Um, Dr. Apgar, the, the Apgar scale is named for her, Dr. Apgar worked in delivery rooms and, and saw that infants were dying for things that they didn't have to die from uh, because they weren't getting care, critical care quickly enough. Um, so she designed this 10 point scale. It's very fast. It can be done on the side of the road. It can be done um, you know, in the back of a taxi, probably not actually. Um, but you know, it can be done um, in, an, in an ambulance, for example. So that's probably a better example. Um, and when they call in and say, we're transporting somebody to the hospital, the baby's just been born, they have an APGAR score of seven, the person on the other end knows generally what that means. And generally what that means is um, there's some stability um, and they're still gonna meet you at the door, but, uh, but they're gonna sort of you know, go through the normal process. If on the other hand, somebody calls from an ambulance and says the baby's just been born and there's an APGAR, APGAR scale of three or four, they know that it's immediate distress, that they need, um, you know, you know, they need to meet that ambulance with a crash cart. They need to throw all the resources they can at saving that infant um, because it needs immediate life-saving care. So, um, so it's helpful to have a really quick test that, um, that everybody knows what the answer means. Um, and so that's, that's what that is. There are videos online um, and you know, you can, you know, you'll be able to see as much or as little of an actual APGAR test as you want to. Um, and then the last thing, um, there are three definitions um, having to do with um, uh, when, the, when the child is born. Um, there are babies that are born preterm, and preterm means um, before 37 weeks. So that baby is born early, and that tells you something. There are also children who are born who are small for date, right? So a small for date baby might be born at term and be small for the number of weeks of, um, since conception, the number of weeks of development, or they might be born preterm. Um, and still be small for what would be expected um, for the number of weeks that, uh, that they've been developing. So, um, so small for date tells you, based on the number of, of days or weeks since conception, there's an expected weight and the child is small for that. Preterm just tells you that it's, it's fewer than 37 weeks and then you can determine the number of weeks. And then lastly, um, low birth weight. And there are subcategories within low birth weight. There's very low birth weight, extremely low birth weight. Um, and I don't expect you, you know, unless you're doing it as part of your own career, um, and at that point you will know these things, to know the number of, uh, of uh, you know, the exact weight, the grams um, that are associated with each of those categories, but just understand that low birth weight is a category and there are subcategories within it. Um, okay, so that's just a general, uh, a general overview of chapter three. Um, if you have questions, let me know. Um, otherwise, have a good week. Thanks, bye.